Today I want to talk about my winter squash plot here behind me. It's looking pretty good, very, very early in the stages of these plants back here. But I want to tell you what we got going on, what we planted, kind of our plans going forward with this plot here. Now, if you follow our channel much, you might remember several months ago, we jumped the gun a little bit with our Irish potato planting. And the end result was that we got a lot of heavy rain right after we planted them. A lot of those seed potatoes rotted in the ground and we ended up with just a small little patch of potatoes that made it. But we had a plan B. We had a plan to come in behind and plant something else here since those potatoes didn't all come up. And that plan B for this plot was winter squash. Now right over here is what taters we had that actually came up and sprouted. These look pretty good. We've got a few little bug issues over there. We might need to come in and spray these guys, but they should be getting pretty close. They've been growing for a while. We've got a few Yukons here and some reds on the end there. Plants are looking pretty healthy. We've had a fairly cool spring, which is always good for potatoes. Hasn't struck off real hot yet. And uh, we might start scratching around for a few of these pretty soon. If we back up a little bit, look at this entire plot here. We can see that those taters take up just a little small fraction there on the corner and the dry spot on that whole plot. We've got the rest of this plot here completely full of winter squash. Now, for those of you out there who may not have dabbled with winter squash in the past, winter squash are squash that are grown in the warmer months, just like your regular summer squash, like your zucchini, your straight neck, your patty pan, your crook neck squash. They call them winter squash because they store a lot longer than summer squash. So you grow them in the warmer months and most of them have a pretty long storage time, up to six months sometimes. So they'll store on into the winter and that's why we call them winter squash. Now, another big difference between winter squash and summer squash is the frequency of harvesting. So with our summer squash that we have growing right now, like our zucchini and our straight neck yellow squash, we'll be picking those rascals almost every other day. They're constantly producing new fruit. That fruit's constantly getting to, you know, the right size where we want to harvest it. So we're out there just steadily picking that stuff throughout the life cycle of that plant. Winter squash, on the other hand, is a crop where we just have a one-time harvest. So we let these plants grow, let them produce that fruit, let that fruit mature on the vine, and then we come in here and harvest them all at one time and then we put them in our storage location. Now there are many, many, many different varieties, all different shapes and sizes of winter squash out there. One of my favorites that I usually grow every year is our small wander spaghetti squash, which is a little personal sized spaghetti squash, really productive. And I've grown that one probably the last three or four years. Really like it. I'm not growing it this spring, because I've got something else here that I want to try. But there's so many different varieties you can try out there with different levels of sweetness. Usually the sweeter they are, the, the lesser the storage time. Uh, like some of the delicatas and things like that don't store as well if they're really, really sweet. But then you've got stuff like butternuts that store really well, acorn squash that store really well. Lots of different shapes and sizes, lots of different options for growing winter squash you can get basically whatever you like there and, and it's a really good crop to have because like i said earlier it stores so well it's really easy to prepare and, and when you've got a good harvest of them underneath the barn you know there's not a lot of work involved you just go out there grab one and throw it in the oven and get a nice quick meal so this year the varieties i decided to grow is a butternut variety called South Anna butternut. And that's what we see in these first three rows here. And this is a variety I have known about for a few years, but my first time getting an opportunity to grow it. And I'm really excited about it. We just added it to the site. It's been really popular so far. I'll tell you why in just a minute. And then over here on the end, this last row here, we've got a row of table ace acorn squash. Now, usually I always direct seed any kind of squash, even winter squash, but this year, I grew them from transplants and I think I'm sold on that. Now these are some I had left over that I kind of just saved just in case any of those guys over there didn't make it. All those guys have made it so far, so we're doing pretty good 100% transplant success. So these here are a little old and just need to be thrown away, but you can see what they look like there. So 
we grow those out in our 162 trays there and got some nice looking transplants in and they took off pretty well once we put them in the ground so i think i'm definitely sold on transplanting winter squash from now on now back to that south anna butternut so back in the day when we used to do a lot of trade shows we ran into some guys from virginia and their whole deal was breeding some of these heirloom squash varieties that had some built-in disease resistant and crossing them with other varieties and trying to take the disease resistance from some of the heirlooms and impart it to some new varieties. And the one they really work with a lot is the Seminole pumpkin. If you've never grown the Seminole pumpkin before, it is a great winter squash. It falls under that winter squash umbrella, although you could call it a pumpkin as well. It's a smaller pumpkin, just full of good meat there. Some people can get them to store for over a year sometimes. Really good variety, really productive variety. It originated in the Everglades. That's why they call it the Seminole pumpkin. And it has a lot of built-in disease resistance, especially powdery and downy mildew. So it's resistant to a lot of these fungal diseases that we can get here in the South due to our humidity and stuff like that. It's also been known to be somewhat bug resistant. Uh, the squash vine borers and other things don't seem to bother it as much as they do other varieties. So it's a great variety to have to try to cross with some of these others and impart those characteristics onto some other winter squash varieties. So what these guys did is they took the Seminole pumpkin and they crossed it with probably the most popular butternut squash variety out there, the Waltham butternut. It's one that's been around for a long, long time. I've grown it before. It does pretty well. But they wanted to give that Waltham butternut those characteristics, those disease resistant characteristics of the Seminole pumpkin, but maintain that butternut shape. So you get a butternut squash that's resistant to all those mildews and stuff like that that can cause some issues with your winter squash. So what they did is they bred these things over years and years and years. It was initially a hybrid, obviously, but now they have a stabilized cross, a stabilized open pollinated cross. You can grow these, save the seeds. They'll be true to variety the next year. So we've got a butternut here that's gonna make some nice big fruits, lots of good meat in there, but it's also gonna be able to withstand some of the humidity and the disease pressures we deal with here in South Georgia. Now let's talk about our planting method here a little bit, and our spacing and all that good stuff. So winter squash need plenty of room. They'll vine out. They'll probably end up running along this grass here, but we can kind of keep them trimmed with the lawnmower. They'll vine out, they'll spread out. They need plenty of room. I usually like to dedicate a whole plot like this because otherwise they're gonna interfere with some of your other plants you have. So we just let them uh, get in here, just let them sprawl and do their thing. I've got these on a four foot row spacing. So all these rows are four feet apart and I've got plants every two feet along the row. Now, some people may think that's a little too close for winter squash and pumpkins, but I've got these puppies on drip tape here. I'm not going to have to do any overhead watering. I can keep them fed, you know, as good as I want to, and I can reduce that leaf moisture, which is going to help us out in the long term, keep the weeds down between these paths here. So we stacked them in here thick, you know, every uh, four feet on the rows and every two feet on the plants. And these have overcame their transplant shop. They're looking pretty good. We can see some new growth there starting on top. So these things will start sprawling out pretty quick. Those leaves right there get big as a lily pad. And I've shot the fertilizer to these one time, injected through my drip system, but it, it's time today. It's been a couple weeks. It's time to shoot a little more juice to them. And I wanna show you how to do that. So today I'm gonna to be feeding these guys pretty much what I feed everything in my vegetable garden, especially early on, early in the life of the plants where we're trying to give them a little jump or a little boost. So we've got our 20-20-20, which is our nitrogen, our phosphorus, and our potassium. It's 20% of each, so this is what we call a balanced fertilizer. You can see it's blue there, which is gonna come in handy. We can see it flowing through that injector line pretty easily there. We got that, and then we've got our micro boost here, which is a micronutrient supplement. Works really good in conjunction with this 20-20-20. 
and this stuff is amazing. You can see the plants pop in just a couple days after applying this to the drip system. Now we've had a lot of people asking about how much do I use on how much area, so forth, all this stuff. And, and I don't try to get too exact with it because what we're doing here is a process called spoon feeding. So we're not giving them a ton of fertilizer to where we're really worried about burning the plants. We're just giving them a little bit every week or two. I usually do it every two weeks. If you want to do it every week, you could do that. Just cut this rate in half. So we're doing some spoon feeding here, just giving them a little bit at the time. We're going to fertilize them every couple weeks this way here. So I've got my 20, 20, 20. This is my little mixing jug I use here. This thing is 64 ounces, so it's a half a gallon. And like I said, I don't get super exact with this, and I'll fill it up probably about three quarters of the way. Like that, with my 20, 20, 20. And then I'll just put me about, you know, I eyeball it, but a couple, two to four cups of this micro boost in here. And I'm just gonna pour it all in here in one jug because we're gonna dissolve it in this cup before we pour it in our injector. I should have mentioned the actual total area I'm using this amount on. So that plot of winter squash I showed you is about a thousand square feet. All my plots are approximately a thousand square feet. That one's about 20 by 60. So 1,200 square feet, we just call it a thousand to keep things simple. So most of my plots are a thousand square feet and this is how much I use. If you were to weigh this out, it's probably one and a half to two pounds of the 20, 20, 20. So about a fifth of that 10 pound bag. And then, like I said, anywhere from two to four cups of this micro boost. You don't have to be super, super exact with it. Now we've got my injector, my easy flow injector tank right here. And you can see that lid on this thing, the mouth of it's kind of narrow. So it's hard to pour that fertilizer in there in a granular form. So we'll dissolve it, use this cup or this pitcher here to dissolve it and then pour it in here. So let me get my water hose on. And I'm just gonna start pouring a little water in here, try to mix it around a little bit, and then I'll pour it in my tank. We'll dissolve a little bit more of it there, stir it around. Pour some more in there. And then, One more time, Mark, to get it all dissolved there. Almost. There we go. And then we'll just go ahead and fill this tank all the way up. That way we don't have to wait on it to fill up when we turn on our injector. We'll just go ahead and fill this puppy all the way up with water. We've got our mixture in there. It's dissolved. This 20-20-20 is super water soluble. Dissolves really easily. I use cold water and it dissolves fine. You can use warm water if you wanted to. All right, we got our tank filled. Now, we just gotta hook everything up. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna do is get my lid on my tank here. I'll make sure that washer is set down in there good on that lid gonna make a nice little tight seal there. Gonna put that on there and get that lid screwed on there nice and tight. Just kind of wrap all these hoses around as we do it here. There we go. All right, so our lid's on there nice and tight. Now before we hook this up to our spigot here, we've got inside here, I don't know if you can see it, the black flow disc. So this thing comes with several different flow discs that you'll use depending on how much water you're outputting with your system. Uh, over here I'm putting out um, what I figured out was about 55 gallons per hour of water so that means I use this black flow disc and sometimes that thing can get turned around in there. I just use this little nail here to make sure it's down in there in a position so it's not going to move. It's kind of 
jammed in there real nice. And then we'll just put this on our spigot and then grab our water hose, hook it up here, get everything nice and happy and tight there. Now these little inline valves on my injector, I wanna make sure those are off right now. We'll turn them on just a second, but while I let this thing charge up, I wanna turn those inline valves off. So then we're gonna crimp our water hose here and hook it up to our drip setup with our filter and our pressure regulator, all that good stuff. Get that nice and tight. And as soon as we uncrimp that hose, we'll start to see these drip tape lines here inflate. And I wanna wait till these things are all the way inflated. Everything's pulling through there properly until I turn that injector on. Okay, back to our injector. I've got it set on the fast setting here, which means uh, over this thousand square feet with that uh, tape ran out there, about 240 feet of tape. This thing should empty in just a couple of hours, an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, we got two lines here, the black line going in, the white line going out. So this is shooting water into the injector. This clear line is gonna be shooting water plus fertilizer back into our water supply, which is running down to the garden, gonna feed those plants. So the first thing I'm gonna do is turn this inline valve on this inline, the black line here on, and that's gonna kind of charge up the tank, create that suction that we need to pull that fertilizer mixture out of here into the water supply. So I'll turn that on just, you know, 10, 15 seconds or so, let it kind of charge up and pressurize there. And then we're gonna flip this one. And as soon as we flip this one, we should start seeing that fertilizer shoot through there. And this is pretty cool, watch. There we go. So we've got that blue mixture, kind of dark blue mixture of that 20, 20, 20 and that micro boost shooting through there, back through that hose bib to our water supply right down there at those plants roots where they can take it up fast and really, really take advantage of this stuff. All right, all right, all right. So that shows you just how easy it is when you've got the right tools and the right setup. I mean, I can come out here 10 minutes have that tank running, have fertilizer feeding those plants. I don't have to stand around here and monitor it. I just come back in an hour and a half, two hours or so, see that that line is now running clear, which means all that fertilizer has been pumped out of that tank and just shut the water off. It's kind of like a set it and forget it, like the old boy that used to sell those rotisserie ovens on TV. So a really easy way to feed your plants with that easy flow injector and you can do it with any water soluble fertilizer. So back to the winter squash real quick. If you're growing winter squash out there, tell me what your favorite varieties are. Maybe some of you have grown that Seminole pumpkin before. Maybe some of you are trying our Cherokee tan pumpkin for the first time this year, which is another great one. Tell me which winter squash varieties you really like for whatever reason, the taste, the storage ability, so forth. If you've never tried growing winter squash, I would highly, highly recommend it. It's a very, very valuable crop to have in your garden. And I'll put some links below to all our winter squash varieties, including the two I have planted here behind me. So you can check those out and get some of those growing in your garden. It's not too late, even down here in zone 8B where we are, I would say you still have some time to get winter squash in the ground. It's one of the last things we plant in spring because it usually likes warmer weather. So still plenty of time to make that decision and get some winter squash growing in your garden. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button below and that bell button so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. If you enjoyed this video, give me a big thumbs up and check out these other two videos right here. One's on our small wander spaghetti squash and another one on how to install that injector I just showed you. We'll see you next time.